Hello everyone, welcome back to the Wolverine.com. Not a whole lot going on today. It's it's weird that we're even here right now. But no, actually, uh Anthony Broom here with the Wolverine.com, joined by EJ Holland, Tim Verkees. It is a uh early signing day is here. Uh a lot is going on. Michigan has signed, I believe, and you guys can correct me here. I think fifteen guys are in the class so far. Um some flips in the um early on in the morning. People don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from the recruiting guys. So we'll throw it right to you, EJ. Uh, what's kind of been the rundown of how the day's gone so far? Yeah, it, uh, you know, started bright and early. Been up since 5 a.m. It's been a, a really fun and, and long day so far. And we still have a couple of announcements left in the afternoon. So we'll definitely talk about that. Uh, you know, some, some key takeaways for me. Obviously, uh, the 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern window was pretty wild. Uh, Keon Saab committed to Michigan and, and obviously signed Amarion Walker flip from Notre Dame, Alex Orgy flip from Virginia Tech. Uh, you know, looking at Amarion Walker and Keon Saab, those were two guys that Ron Bellamy really led the way with uh, in their recruitments. And, you know, with Ron Bellamy, he's really a rising star in the recruiting industry and in the coaching world too. Um, but I think he kind of flexes muscles a little bit, landing those guys back to back. Uh, Amarion Walker, an athletic wide receiver that also has the uh, potential to play defensive back. And then Keon Saab, one of the more elite safety prospects in the country that's, you know, bigger safety type that can, can be a box safety or a uh, spin down a linebacker. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, they also were able to get Alex Orgy, a four-star quarterback um, from Texas. I actually uh, am from Dallas, as some of you guys might know. And lived in the same suburb as uh, as Orgy. I actually covered both of his older brothers, so I had a, an inkling he was going to flip to Michigan. Uh, and you know, as far as what what Michigan's getting, I mean, a lot of people may might not know too much about Orgy just because he popped up on the scene pretty late. But he's a, a big, athletic kid uh, that has the flexibility to play multiple positions, including uh, linebacker. He can be an edge rusher. He actually has played some wide receiver as well um but as a quarterback he's a guy that still needs mechanical work and, and accuracy work but he does have a strong arm and he can make plays with his legs and orgy's a guy that michigan prioritized over Jaden denigal early in the cycle before he committed to virginia tech he actually fits more of the mold of what weiss is or matt weiss is looking for at the quarterback position. I think Jaden Denigal is athletic enough to run, but he's not a true dual threat quarterback. I think Orgy is more of a dual threat quarterback. Uh, so, I mean, all three uh, were really nice lanes for Michigan during that window. That was probably my biggest takeaway uh, from the day. And I'm sure we'll talk about all the signees and everything. So uh, I just wanted to kind of lead it off with that uh, 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern window. Tim, what was kind of your biggest uh, takeaway other than that from the uh, first part of the day. Yeah, the biggest takeaway was, you know, getting most of the guys in the class. You know, there's only a handful of guys kind of left to sign. Most are expected to sign. We've got a couple we're kind of watching to hear down the stretch. Um, you know, and a couple of decisions we've got watching down the stretch. But, you know, getting everyone pretty much in. You know, there was some initial concern last night over Damani Dent, but he he's in the class officially. He signed. Um, you know, last night there was some con concern with some of the targets. Keon Saab was one of them. And now he's in the class. And so, you know, being able to seal the deal with some of these targets, being able to seal the deal uh, with some of these commits and, and officially kind of, you know, make it official is, is pretty big for, for Michigan, especially after some of the concern, especially late last night. Yeah, well, like we said before, uh, Michigan does have 15 signees on the day. Uh, that includes Andrew Gentry, the guy from uh, who was originally committed to Virginia and uh, is going to Michigan now. Uh, Amorian Walker was a big one. I'm sure you guys will talk about that. But other guys that have signed so far, like you said, Keon Saab, Zeke Berry, Tyler Morris, Jimmy Rolder, Colston Loveland, Mason Graham, Marlon Klein, Miles Pollard, Micah Pollard, Damani Dent, CJ Stokes, Connor Jones, and Alessandro Lorenzetti. So, uh, so far, no surprises, guys, right? No, no not, not, not too many surprises. I think, you know, last night, uh, is when we really caught wind of Ethan Burke flipping out of Michigan's class, flipping to Texas. Uh, we ended up moving our predictions to to flip predictions to Texas. So if you're a subscriber to the Wolverine, you were kind of aware of that. But it did happen late last night where maybe some people might have missed the momentum shift. Basically, Texas came in 
with an offer. Ethan Burke is from uh, Austin, where the University of Texas is located. He plays at Westlake, which is traditionally a feeder program for Texas. Um, and they were just able to swing him late. And that was more of a thing of, of just being closer to home and, and having that familiarity with the University of Texas. But losing Burke makes things pretty interesting here from an edge rusher standpoint. Uh, you lose Burke. Kevontae Henry is not signing today. I would not expect him in the class come February. So, you know, you're down a couple of edge rushers. Now you look at who's in the class. Micah Pollard was originally an edge rusher take, but he might end up being more of a, an inside backer, just depending on how he grows. Um, and then you look at the, the late window, Derek Moore, if Michigan's able to land him, he's kind of a tweener guy that can add some weight and be a three tech, or he can be an edge guy, but they don't have uh, that true, true edge that, that they were getting in a Burke or, or even a Cavante Henry, uh, assuming they lose out on him. Uh, 2023 is absolutely loaded with high-end edge rushers that are extremely interested in Michigan. Uh, but for this cycle, I'm really curious to see if they look at some names late, you know, once everything, once the dust settles, if um, they look at the transfer portal, because the, the Burke news also hit the Michigan staff pretty late. Uh, from what I know, they, they really weren't aware that Burke wasn't going to sign until last night. And just had some uh, breaking news here. Uh, Alex Orgy is signed in the class. So that's another guy. They're up to 16 now. So uh, we knew he was committed, but he is signed now. Um, I don't know, uh, Tim, how are you feeling about some of these afternoon guys thinking uh, everything's going to go as planned there, right? Yeah, Michigan, you know, we're kind of watching a couple things. One is, I mean, for, for the commits, one we're watching is Cody Jones is uh, making his announcement here soon. We're expecting it to be Michigan. Obviously, he's in the class and he's committed, uh, but he does have three hats on the table, Michigan, Tennessee, and Illinois. Uh, so that's something we're watching. Uh, you know, Derek Moore and Darius Clemens are, are two that are making decisions. We, me and EJ both have predictions on on Michigan to land both. Um, Cohen Entringer is also making an afternoon decision here at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, that one's a bit more of a toss-up. Uh, I don't have a prediction in. EJ has a prediction in for Iowa, I believe. Um, Iowa, Wisconsin, Boston College, and Michigan are all involved in that recruitment. Uh, so those are the kind of things we're watching down the stretch. Um and then just making just formalities at this point, you know, making sure Will Johnson gets his papers in, making sure Kenneth Grant and uh, some of these other guys, you know, get their papers in. Another one would be Deuce Spurlock, who, you know, over the weekend at, at one point, you know, there was talk about him wavering. Um, so we're kind of watching to make sure that he he officially gets his paper in. He's been pretty active on social media today, you know, kind of supporting some of his, his fellow Michigan commits. So, you know, hopefully things stick with Michigan, um, but, you know, Florida and Auburn and a couple other SEC uh, area schools have been pushing for him. Cool. Well, yeah. uh, for the people watching right now, and thank you if you are, and, and if you're not familiar with our page, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we'll be doing more live streams, more videos, more a lot of content coming out of uh, the early signing period and college football playoff and all that stuff. So definitely going to want to hit this, uh, that subscribe button below. So basically what we're going to do over the next, I mean, 50 minutes or so at this point, is Tim and EJ are here to more or less take your questions. We'll talk about what's ever on your mind in terms of recruiting um, and some of the stuff that's still out there, some of the things that didn't go Michigan's way. I saw a couple questions. I guess we'll start it off with this because um, it came in from a couple people. Uh, Deion Walker uh, winds up going to Kentucky. Uh, I guess just kind of give us a rundown of what happened there and um, why it's not Michigan today. <laughs> Yeah, so the Deion Walker recruitment got really, really interesting last week. Um, early in the week, I was pretty confident he was going to Kentucky. Uh, then he made a midweek official visit to Michigan, and I still said, hey, guys, temper expectations, still probably Kentucky. And Kentucky got him on campus for a weekend official visit. Um, at that point, he decided that he was going to come back to Michigan for an unofficial visit. And I had also heard the Kentucky official visit didn't go exactly as planned. So that gave Michigan some optimism. That gave me some optimism. They got him back on campus on Sunday. Like I said, they had him, uh, I think it was like a, a dinner at a country club. And then they got him on campus and had their final meetings with him. And, and Steve Klingscale made a really, really aggressive push with Deion Walker 
you guys might remember, Klinkscale was at Kentucky and was the guy that offered Dion Walker and it was his primary recruiter there. So, um, you know, Klink had also made an in-home visit uh, right before his uh, midweek official visit. And so things started to look more on the up and up for Michigan. Monday, I, I started feeling a little better about it. Michigan, I know, was starting to feel a little more optimistic about it. Tuesday afternoon comes. I don't think <laughs> I don't think Will Johnson will really care at this point. But I met up with Will Johnson to to do some some videos and stuff. And I asked Will what he thought about Dion. I told him that I was feeling a little better, that I had heard Michigan was feeling a little better. And Dion had actually texted Will and told him he he was likely going to come to Michigan. So that's when I was like, all right, all right, everything's kind of lining up here. It's going to be good. So I get back home to Chicago Tuesday night, and I I want to say like all this all these news spurts happened like in an hour, or so, like in a range of one hour, where like the staff was taking a bunch of calls. Um, I got a text, and it just said Dion to to UK, and I was like, really? And he was like, yeah. The whoever I was texting was like, yeah, Dion to UK. And I texted another person and I was like, Dion to UK? And they're like, yeah. So it just kind of uh, happened where Kentucky got back on the phone with him, made a, from what I heard, made a really aggressive NIL pitch um, and, and kind of, you know, also pitched him on, on having a better pathway to early playing time uh, and being more of a face of that class, which they had already kind of reiterated while, uh, while he was on campus. But I think Michigan, um, wasn't up to par on the NIL standpoint and moving forward just to keep it 100 like moving forward these recruitments some of these recruitments are going to be NIL based it does not matter what Michigan does on the field it does not matter that Harbaugh is going to be here you know forever now it seems like it doesn't matter that you know the, there appears to be stability across the board for the most part as far as the assistants um, doesn't matter that Michigan may win a national championship. What's going to matter is how aggressive Michigan's going to be in NIL. And I know a lot of people want details. What can Michigan do with NIL? Look, right now, NIL is still very much a gray area. People that have played the game, so to speak, before NIL existed, they're still doing it with NIL. So um, it's... I, I'll kind of leave it at that and leave it open-ended. I mean, these, so again, some of these recruitments, it's not, there's nothing Michigan can really do. I mean, Steve Klingscale worked his ass off. Ron Bellamy worked his ass off. Sean Newell worked his ass off. At the end of the day, Dion uh, decided to go uh, to Kentucky uh, for, you know, reasons that he had. Uh, Michigan's obviously the better program. Michigan can offer much better academics. Michigan can probably offer better NIL in the long run. But what matters right now is is the pitch they're making in the uh, in the immediate as opposed to the future. Well, we do have a question here from Matt Young, who uh, it's a quick hitter. Uh, what what time are we looking at for Will Johnson to sign today? Do we have any details on his ceremony, fellas? Uh, Three p.m. Eastern for Will is his party. Our Clayton Safey will be there to provide some coverage. Um, he might get it in sooner than the party. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I know Will's going all out there. <laughs> I was about to give out the uh, location of, of Will Johnson's uh, signing party, but I don't want like a bunch <laughs> of randos to, to show up there and like peek in, make sure he's signing. No, his not house. our fans. <laughs> but he's uh, he's no, he, he is uh, having his party at three, so it, it might be closer to that. I mean, a lot of people forget like the early signing window goes all the way to Friday. Like they could honestly just wait till Friday and not even partake in this, but. I would expect Will to get his in, uh, you know, shortly in the afternoon. Kenneth Grant also is having his uh, signing day ceremony at three. So, you know, a lot of these guys might wait to, to submit it closer to uh, when their teammates are submitting it or when they're having their family around. They might want to make it a little bit of a spectacle, maybe take some photos with a fax machine if those exist or just your standard computer. Um, but, Do they but still yeah. use fax machines, EJ? Like, how does that work now? Uh from what I know, most people just use PDFs, but I mean, I don't see why you couldn't use a fax machine if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, so this one comes from G Soper, and this is for Tim, because I believe you were the one that reported it over the weekend. Um, 
How are we looking with the center from Virginia who's possibly transferring? You guys hear anything about that? Yeah, honestly, it's it's been kind of quiet since the visit. I think it's going to be one of those things that um, we're transferring. He um, he has said he think he's he's still open to the opportunity to return to Virginia. And honestly, he's he's in an interesting position. I I think I I even question like his his decision to kind of transfer rather than uh, just declare for the NFL draft. He's grad transferring, and he just you know he's an All American and uh, just finishes a finalist for the Remington. He's one of the best safe one of the best centers in the country. Um, so he's got a couple options, you know, NFL. I'm sure he's going to take some other visits. Um, obviously, we're, we're in a dead period now. We're in a dead period till Jan 10th. Um, and the only visit he's taken that I know of is Michigan. So, uh, you know, Michigan is in a comfortable spot with him. But th- there's some time with him. He's got kind of time to make a decision. With some of these transfers, you know, it's not, it's not up to Wednesday. It doesn't come down to these next three days to make a decision. They've got kind of as much time as they want as long as they're in kind of before spring uh spring spring ball uh they're really good to go so uh, we haven't really heard anything since the visit um sounds like the visit went well but obviously you know you kind of got to wait and kind of see um you know what he decides to do and and uh because he does have a he's a more unique position than most uh most uh transfers well, right, we'll go to this question here from Andy now, who I assume he's talking about Amari and Walker. He says, oh, Walker position. What have we heard on that? Is it? I know he was listed as a wide receiver, but is there anything else in play there for him? Yeah, um, Amari on Walker, I think, uh, you know, in my opinion, I feel like Amari on Walker um, will likely end up being on the defensive side of the ball. Michigan is giving him every opportunity to play uh, wide receiver. They recruited him at wide receiver. They made him a priority at wide receiver. But Alabama, LSU, both offered him as a defensive back. I went out and I saw him live um, out in New Orleans, and uh, he played limited DB reps. But just watching him play corner, I was like, man, this guy could, could be a really tall, long corner or a safety type if he learns to be aggressive. Some of the things that I liked about Amarion Walker as a wide receiver are the speeds there. He runs a legit 4-4. He clocked a, a 4-4 at the Alabama camp, which is why they offered. He's about six foot three. He has a really lanky, long frame, uh, great catch radius, can go up and get it, but it's not necessarily a natural pass catcher. Um, he does run some pretty lazy routes. Uh, doesn't sink his hips and get in and out of breaks. Um, so he's not a true route runner. Uh, so those are the things that kind of concern me a little bit. Uh, and then he's just kind of not aggressive. If you get a Will Johnson type of corner on him that just presses him and, and bullies him a little bit at the line of scrimmage, he kind of gets down. So I, I, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, obviously you need kind of more of a physical mentality. So I think Michigan needs to get aggression out of him whether it's on offense or on defense, he needs to be more aggressive and less, you know, uh, gun shy. Uh, but from a corner standpoint, it just looked like he was moving really well, really comfortable. And it's no surprise that here down the stretch, Steve Klingscale has had some conversations about him maybe moving over to the defensive side of the ball or giving defense a try as well. Um, so in my opinion, he, he likely will eventually end up on the defensive side of the ball, but he did. He was up front with Michigan uh, throughout the recruiting process and let him know I want to be a wide receiver. So Michigan's going to honor that and, and see how it goes with uh, wide receiver. And you know he could be a guy that that surprises and you know adds some weight and, and develops that aggression and improves his route running. Um, but we'll kind of see. He's more of a, a little bit of a, a, a tweener athlete right now. I mean, really good measurables. I mean, you see the height. You see a six three guy running a four four. And, uh, and obviously that athletic profile jumps out at you. But uh, when you look at what he does on, on, on film or when you go watch him live, um, you know, there's a lot to be desired for. He did have a really great state championship um, last week, which I thought was encouraging. Um, but I, I think with, with Walker right now, it's more, uh, more of an upside take, more of a ceiling what he can become. All right, well, Jim Schreiber here wants to know a little bit more about Andrew Gentry. He says, is he older since he spent some time doing his missionary work? Let's just maybe run through the background on Gentry and his recruitment. And he was originally in a 2020 guy, so, but he's part of this 2022 class. So what's, what's the background and the story there? 
Yeah, so sorry, Tim. I'll take this one as well. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, no, I covered Gentry. Um, actually, my first few months on the Michigan beat, uh, when I joined the Michigan beat, I went out and I saw Gentry a couple of times out in Colorado. My wife's originally from Colorado, so I go out there quite frequently. So I went out and, and saw him twice. Um, I don't think anybody really remembers my coverage because I was a no name like the Michigan beat at that time and nobody really cared. But I did get a chance to get two live evals out of him, and I absolutely loved Andrew Gentry. I mean, this was a guy that was a legit six foot eight. I mean, I'm six foot one, and he made me look like a, a baby boy. Um, he's six eight, three hundred pounder uh, that absolutely mauled people. I mean, just a bully, and he th- was actually playing against some decent competition uh, in that game. Um, he was going head to head with uh, Notre Dame defensive tackle uh, Aiden Kiahana in that game in particular but uh on tape he's not playing against great competition but he does exactly what he you know should do and he just you know kills people at least he did two years ago at the high school level i mean and and then in in past sets he looked extremely comfortable i mean he was the total package for me and he wasn't like a tall skinny guy that needed to add weight like a, a connor jones this cycle gentry was really well built like just a big dude um he was a true towering tackle and, uh, you know, th- obviously he ended up signing with Virginia. A big reason for him picking Virginia over Michigan initially is because Bronco Mendenhall uh, shares the same faith that he does. And, uh, of course, Bronco Mendenhall left Virginia uh, unexpectedly this offseason, which opened the door for Michigan to get in uh, with Gentry. But I always loved him. I had him graded as a top 100 prospect. I was very, very high on him. He is older now. Yeah, he, he he has aged while on the mission trip. So it's been two years. Um, I believe he's 20 years old right now. Um, he has lost some weight. Uh, it, it's going to happen when you're a missionary. You uh, only get 30 minutes of workout time a day. So he definitely hasn't been doing your traditional football workout. So he'll have to get the weight back. More importantly, he'll have to get the strength back, you know, you've lifted weights before, you know, if you stop lifting weights, you, you know, gradually decrease in strength. So I think he's going to be a guy that needs to develop in the strength and conditioning program. Um, But I think with Gentry, like I said, he was already a bigger guy. He wasn't a a skinnier guy. So I think he's going to have enough room to add the weight. He's going to get it back fairly quickly, especially under Ben Herbert, who does a phenomenal job with Michigan strength and conditioning program. Um, he is set to return from his mission, I believe, in May. So he should be at Michigan in June. Um, but I think Gentry was a, a terrific steal and might end up being like the the best late addition, you know, despite all these fireworks with, you know, Saab and Walker and Orgy, et cetera. Like Andrew Gentry is going to be a guy that, that might be ready to go if he does get that weight and strength back fairly quickly. Great. Well, let's get Tim Verghese some work here. He's, he's quiet over there. I want to get him involved. Um, Darius Clemens, a, a top 100 guy uh, on the on three uh, consensus uh, wide receiver that uh, has kind of the, the charges come on pretty quickly for Michigan over the last you know week or so. It seems here the on three recruiting prediction machine has a 78.4% chance. He winds up at Michigan. Tim, how are you feeling about that recruitment? Uh, I'm still feeling good. Real quick, before I get into that, I know earlier in the uh, the stream I said we were watching Cody Jones. He did pick Michigan. His papers aren't in yet. He hasn't officially signed, but it, it's he's sticking with Michigan. So good news on that front. Uh, the DB class is, is looking really, really impressive. Um, as far as Clemens, I still feel good about Michigan. Um, you know, me and EJ kind of talked yesterday. At, at one point yesterday, there was a little bit of a concern, um, but things have, things have kind of uh sharpened up it sounds like uh there's a there's a peer recruiting effort from all fronts from from will johnson potentially even from keon saab and also the, the coaching staff um to pull him in he is originally from michigan he is uh childhood friends with uh, michigan freshman wide receiver andre anthony so a lot of connections there um i still feel good about michigan and michigan offers him the best opportunity right now of his three schools you know he was he was down to auburn and oregon at one point but uh you know, with questions surrounding Brian Harson's future at Auburn and uh, obviously Mario Cristobal leaving kind of makes things a little interesting for him. Uh, and that got Michigan back into the picture. And Michigan, of those three situations, is the most stable right now with Harbaugh expected to be extended for the foreseeable future after this season. 
All right, well, this is one we'll keep. I, I want to get both of you guys in here on this. Obviously, one of the uh, the stories of the day was Travis Hunter flipping from Florida State to Jackson State. You don't see a guy, a five star guy, go from FBS to FCS. I don't think it's ever happened. But um, we have a question here. What do you guys think the consequences of the Hunter situation will have in recruiting? I think uh, I think Tim's been actually following that one more throughout the day, so I'll kind of uh, let him answer that one. Yeah, um, I, I think from a bigger picture standpoint, obviously this this thing's been kind of crazy. So, um, you know, there was there was buzz kind of entering signing day that Travis Hunter, who's been a longtime Florida State commit, grew up a Florida State fan, always wanted to play at Florida State, talked about playing at Florida State because of his grandma. Um, and he all seemed signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, you know, there were he made some visits in the year, but he always said he was committed. Um and there was some buzz entering the week of, you know, is he potentially on flip watch? And, and they were like, well, I mean, the only option would be Georgia, but it's not going to be Georgia. And this morning, it kind of came out that uh, Jackson State was uh, making an aggressive push for him with some NIL stuff and uh, things like that, you know, some stuff behind the scenes. But yeah, Jackson State was able to land. It's a, it's a massive, massive ad. Um, you know, it, it kind of paves the way for HBC, HBCUs, you know, Deion's, Deion Sanders, obviously the head coach at Jackson State, and he's talked about um, kind of wanting to put HBCUs back on the map. You know, they, there was a time where, you know, a lot of NFL guys were coming out of there, and now uh, it's it's not even so much, even last draft, not a single HBCU player was drafted. So Travis is, is almost 100% going to change that no matter, pretty much no matter what happens in his college career, he's going to get drafted. That's just the type of talent he is. Um, this isn't a situation where there were any concerns behind the scenes of grades or, or, uh, ego or, you know, any off field issues with him. This was just simply a, he made a decision to kind of pave the way for the future. Um, and he's going to have an opportunity. If he was at Florida state, he would have had the opportunity to play wide receiver and cornerback. He's going to have the opportunity to play pretty much whatever he wants at Jackson state, whether it's wide receiver, whether that's cornerback, punt return, kick return. If he wants to play some quarterback, they're going to let him play quarterback because he's Travis Hunter jr. Um, <laughs> He's a guy that he's probably the most fun recruit to watch in in this cycle. I mean, put, turn on this film and he's 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 really really fun. Um, you know, really uh really polished on both sides of the ball. Really twitchy. Just a very very natural athlete. His seven on seven highlights are insane. Um, so if you get a chance to watch his highlights, definitely do that. And uh, I know I'll for sure be tuned into some Jackson State games just for him. So that's just the level of impact that he has. And I did I did see on social media that it seems like there's an NI deal with an NIL deal with him in play with Penn National Gaming, which uh, has something to do with Barstool, which obviously Deion Sanders has ties to that place as well. So uh, a lot of crazy stuff not happening illegal. today. So uh, how is that not illegal? <laughs> how is any of this legal, man? It's so funny that there are people that are like, oh gosh, it's crazy to see how money is is ruling over college athletics now. It's like, where have you been the last? X amount of years. It's kind of just how it goes. But well, let's go to a question here from Chris Carter. This is one both of you guys will be able to get in on. Uh, he says, I understand it's early, but who of all the recruits that we have, who has the chance to make the fastest impact? So we'll start with EJ on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple guys that I, I think uh, have a chance to make an immediate impact. Obviously, Will Johnson, you know, comes to mind right away, just being a guy that is the highest rated prospect in the class. Um, you know, more of a, a lockdown corner, but has experience playing safety, played a lot of safety as a senior. Um, his team, Gross Point South, um, gave him an opportunity to play there just so he had more of a chance to make plays on the ball. Um, but I, I think that he's a guy that can do a little bit of everything in the secondary if needed. Um, I, I do think later on in his career, he will be that true lockdown outside corner that takes away his side of the field. But I think if Michigan needs a nickel guy, if Michigan needs a safety guy, Will can definitely play. And, and the thing about Will is he's been taking in practices like almost on a weekly basis. He's, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but Will goes to the campus like once a week to watch practice and just take in what they're doing that week, how they're game planning what the scheme's looking like. Um, so he's already been learning. And he graduates December 22nd, and he told me his plan is to, like, join Michigan for practice that day um, and get a few practices in before Christmas and before they head out to Florida and before he heads out to the Under Armour game. Um, so so Will is very eager, and he's already just been – he's had the advantage of being around 
practices, being around the program his whole life with his dad being an ex Wolverine. So I think Will uh, will will make an early impact. I think Kenneth Grant will make an early impact. You know, he's the first true knows that this new defensive staff has landed. He's tailor made for what they want at that position. I mean, he's six uh, six five, three hundred and forty pounds. He doesn't carry the weight that poorly. I mean, he looks pretty good for a 340 pound guy. Um, you know, when you look at uh, a guy like Dion Walker, uh, I thought he needed to shape up his body quite a bit. When you look at Kenneth Grant, yes, he needs to shape up his body, but it's not to that extent. I think he's a guy that'll be ready to go. Um, he's had a uh, really, really good coaching at Merrillville high school, Brad Sice, the head coach there does a phenomenal job. Wouldn't surprise me if he gets a, a job in college football here in the near future. Um, and the other thing about Kenneth is he's not just this big, massive, you know, guy that's just going to stuff the middle. He's really nimble on his feet. If you pull up his film and he sorts his film in like the weirdest way, like his, he has like great plays scattered throughout the film and normally they're all in front. But uh, if you sit there and you watch like the full reel uh, of his highlights, you can see just how special he is as a guy that can even come off uh, come off the edge as a five tech and get after the quarterback he, even in the interior if, if he's playing a nose or he's playing a three he uses his, his hands really well he has violent hands he has a killer spin move um, I mean he just completely swims over people and you know someone pointed out uh, on the uh, on the fort our, our great message board they're like it looks like Kenneth Grant's just playing against a bunch of little kids and so it's not that impressive and it's like dude. First of all, Ken Grant plays in the highest classification in Indiana. Uh, I believe they made the state semifinals three years in a row. Grant's been starting since he was a sophomore. So he plays against pretty decent high school competition. And I mean, let's face it, if you're facing a six foot five, 340 pounder, those are pretty rare and opposing high school offensive linemen are likely not going to want to mess with you. So I think you have to look past Kenneth Grant just blowing by people on film and really look like, wow, this, look at the, the way this guy's feet are moving at 340 pounds. Look at the way he's using his hands. Look at the way he's spinning and swimming. And I think, look at the way he's playing the five technique at 340 pounds. Like, I think all those things you have to look at other than just, you know, the, the little high school guards avoiding him. Yeah. And we lost Tim. Uh, or he's coming back. Tim is back. What's up, Tim? Sorry, we are dealing with some weather. I'm in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska right now, and we are dealing with some weather this afternoon. It's supposed to be super windy and, and rainy, so Wi-Fi is popping no worries, in and out. Man. Well, I'll throw this question over to you. I mean, of, of I know you haven't been on the Michigan recruiting beat too long, but of the guys that they have in this class, uh, you know, EJ just talked about a guy like Kenneth Grant. Um, who do you see as someone that could be stepping and play pretty quickly and have an impact? I think uh, I think Kenneth's a good answer. Um, I think any of the DB Zeke, Zeke and Will are good answers. Uh, I think I'm going to stick on the offensive side of the ball of a guy that could be a potential commit. We're still waiting on it. Obviously, is Darius Clemens. Um, I think Clemens gives Michigan something they don't really have. He's six three. I think he's a little bigger than six three, and he runs a. He's got a verified four three seven. Um, I think that speed at that size just this is something Michigan doesn't have. It gives them the opportunity to stretch the field. Um, and he's a receiver that can. Like, you know, what, what Ohio State's put out in the field year in and year out at wide receiver, that's what Michigan's going to be able to do if Clemens is on board. You know, a player like Clemens gives them that that true wide receiver one that can really stretch the field in no matter the type of offense. So I think I think Clemens is a, is a guy um, to keep an eye on. He's going to continue to fill out. He's already – he plays very physical for his size, um, but he's still got, you know, space to kind of add, you know, maybe 10, 15 pounds to his frame if he really wants to. Um without losing too much of his speed. Um, hey, he's not, you know, he's not the speedster that Xavier Worthy was, but, you know, he is bigger than Xavier Worthy was. And, um, you know, he's got comparable speed where, you know, he's a very similar type of receiver. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him on the field as soon as his freshman year. Well, of course, we are uh, Anthony Broom, EJ Holland, and Tim Verghese from TheWolverine.com here for the next 20 to 25 minutes or so taking your questions here during a bit of a lull in the action on the early signing period. Uh, guys, we talked about him a little bit earlier. Derek Moore is one of the guys in the afternoon that we're waiting on here. And uh, Newber wants to know if we have an update on him. What's um, Where are we stand in his recruitment um, in terms of the coverage throughout the day? And, and what's just give us kind of an overview of, of how we got to this point. 
Yeah, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and start. I was actually going to interrupt you to give uh, the people of Derek Moore uh, update. So this works out perfectly. <laughs> um, but the, uh, we we had kind of once Derek Moore, um, you know, news broke that he was going to be on campus over the weekend. We kind of had a good inkling it was getting to Michigan. Obviously, um, you know, his high school, former high school coach, uh, Biff Pogge is on staff. And so, you know, that kind of correlates with, with an NCAA rule that states that uh, a high school coach in an off the field role can't recruit at that school. But, uh, you know, Biff didn't really coach more last year due to COVID. They were successful the first time around uh, when Biff uh, left Michigan and, and got a waiver for Blake Quorum. And I think they're very confident now that they can clear the NCAA rule hurdle, especially with the, the whole COVID situation. So that was the one thing we were looking at. Um, I, I put in a pick uh, over the weekend with lower confidence. I've since raised that confidence up, especially now, uh, texting back and forth with a couple of sources. Uh, they have indicated that they are feeling very, very good about Derek Moore. Um, so right now I'm expecting him in Michigan's class. Um, I did uh, exchange some messages with those around Michigan too, just because we've all kind of been curious, not, not just me and Tim as reporters, but I know you guys as fans, is what the hell is Derek Moore going to be? Because you look at him and he's more of a, a six foot, three and a half, 250 pound guy right now, 255 pound guy. So he's not necessarily ideal for any one position just based off of his uh his frame but he's really really good i mean he was the maryland player of the year i saw him at under armor um under armor baltimore last summer and he was clearly one of the best guys there i remember seeing seeing Derek moore and actually at the time as well being like i don't know what that guy's gonna play but he's really good <laughs> so um I, I i've been texting back and forth here it looks like Michigan is going to start him off as more of an edge role um, with the opportunity to, to play some buck as well. Like I said earlier in the show, I mean, he could add some weight uh, and, and be a guy that, that plays with his hand in the dirt, but he's just so athletic and, and he moves so well for his size. I think Michigan wants to get him a little more on the edge, get him in, in space a little bit more to where he can just kind of roam around and make plays. But um, yeah, that's kind of what they're looking at with Derek Moore. And right now we still feel very, very good about him and, and even better about him ending up in the class. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll add on more as well. You know, I, um, I, his best asset is his speed off the edge. And I think, you know, if you, if you move him down to the defensive line as a three tech and add some weight to him, you're taking away his best asset. Um, even though he would be successful either way, um, and I wouldn't be too worried too much about the height. I think I think that's a it's it's a concern because for the most part Michigan is looking for six five and above at the edge rusher position. I mean, you look at Ojabo and Hutchinson this year. You know, look at the, some of the commits they have. obviously Burke flipped, but Burke was another one that kind of fit that six 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 seven mold. Um, but you know, schools across the country have outside linebackers that are six four and are very successful. Um, Will Anderson is not all that big. I think he is closer to six three six four. Um, that's not to say. Derek Moore is ever going to be Will Anderson. Will Anderson is a really special edge rusher, but more of from a frame standpoint, from a size standpoint, I wouldn't be too worried about that. He's going to be a bit of a undersized edge rusher in Michigan system, but you know, between the speed, his overall athleticism, and just the type of player he is, I think he can more than compensate for that, especially as he adds more weight. You know, he is about two over two fifty. I've heard close to two sixty at times, but he holds it really, really well. He holds it closer to like a two thirty five, two forty. Um, as he continues to, you know, stick in the weight room and, and kind of add some more weight, you know, he could get up to 275 and it could look closer to 250. Uh, he could look really slight, but he could, he could weigh a whole lot and pack a heavy punch. And so I'm, I'm not too worried about him. And I think, you know, Michigan, Michigan pushed for a reason, you know, Michigan, uh, took him for a reason, you know, they, they cleared these hurdles for a reason. It's just kind of an extra headache that they had to take on to even win this recruitment that, you know, I trust that they have a plan plan for him and they probably trust their their plan for him as well if they were willing to go through all that paperwork so late in the process tim made a great point he carries his weight like a 235 pound guy and not like a 255 pound guy so that's a really really nice point um i covered a guy similar to that uh joseph asai uh who was out of the houston area uh, kind of carried his weight in the same way. He's now in the NFL, uh, played at the University of Texas. But, 
you can be a really successful edge rusher with that type of frame if you carry it the way Moore does. For sure. Uh, it's, it's a big get for them, or it would be a big get for them like we talked about earlier, given uh, what the edge rusher situation looks like right now. I want to go to NSTHTV, who is asking who the early enrollees will be. I think we have that list somewhere. Um, we have that list somewhere. <laughs> There's a lot of lists in a lot of places right now, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I will start off with the guys just off the top of my head, um, just rolling through the positions. Jaden Denegal is an early enrollee. Alex Orgy is an early enrollee. Tyler Morris is an early enrollee. If Michigan gets Darius Clemens, he will be an early enrollee. Amorion Walker is an early enrollee. Connor Jones is an early enrollee. Mason Graham is an early enrollee. Aaron Alexander is an early enrollee. Um, Will Johnson is an early enrollee. Uh, Cody Jones is an early enrollee. Miles Pollard is an early enrollee. Keon Saab is an early enrollee. And ooh, I might have missed someone. <laughs> I think that's mostly it. Okay. Well, I have a question yeah. here. Uh, someone couldn't get onto the live stream, so they DM, they sent a Twitter DM to me. So they said, uh, I was curious if EJ or Tim knew the status of uh, DeMonte Trianum, the transfer recruitment, and what your guys' thoughts on him are. I believe Tim broke that uh, news, actually, that he was visiting, so I will leave Tim to answer. Yeah, um, I don't – don't know what 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 the uh, status is after his visit. I do know he is originally from Ohio, so you know a return to the Midwest makes a lot of sense for him. Um, there was some concern, I think, when I broke the news and we kind of talked about it on the board at the time of where does he fit in? Does this scare off Donovan Edwards? Is this you know is this a cause for concern? I, right at, at this point, if Michigan was to take him, I'd say there's no real reason for concern. Michigan's done a really good job of balancing three running backs this year. Um, and, you know, obviously Edwards has come on a little more strong and played a bigger role in the last couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, you figure Edwards is going to play the Hassan Haskins role. And if, you know, Trey Inum was to join the class, he would play the Edwards role this year in a sense. Um, you know, he's a bigger physical running back that could, you know, come in on short yardage situations. He kind of offers a change of pace between Quorum and Hassan uh, and uh, Donovan Edwards next year if he, if he were to join the class. Um, and I... You know, and especially Michigan system, you can never really have too many ready to go running backs. You know, they've got another freshman, uh, Tavier Dunlap, uh, who's who's talented in his own right, and you know he's continuing to develop. So I wouldn't be too worried about you know what the potential take means for the running back room. Um, Trainum does have four years. He uh, he he has a free NIL year. He hasn't used a redshirt year, so you know he can come in redshirt for a year. At that point, Edwards would have one more year. Quorum would probably be on his way out. Um, and so you're looking at a you know, like a, a, a three-way running back uh, head between him, potentially C.J. Stokes, Tavier Dunlap, and Donovan Edwards. So uh, I, I think the take uh, makes a lot of sense if Michigan were to were to get him. I've heard uh, from talking to people close to Arizona State about him. They really like him. You know, he was their, he was their number two back this year. Uh, he was going to step into a bigger role next year. Um, at times found himself in the coach's doghouse over some fumbling issues, but you know, that, that can be resolved and, and no one better to do it than Mike Hart. So um, I, I think if, uh, if he ends up being a take and we'll check in with him after we kind of get through the chaos that is this week. But you know, once we, once we get past that, we'll have, have a better idea of where things sit with him. Also, just to add from a recruiting perspective, running back has been down nationally. Just, just looking at the overall recruiting landscape, 2022, was a fairly weak year at running back nationally in Michigan, obviously picked up CJ Stokes, who's a, a good take and be a, a compliment back uh, or even exceed expectations and maybe be a, a, an every down back. But he wasn't, you know, a big star landing, but I don't think a lot of schools had big star running back landings. And um, you look at 2023, it's kind of the same way. There's some, some really good backs out there, but you know, maybe you, know, you, you look past Ruben Owens, who's a five star down in Texas. There might be a couple others. There isn't a ton of, of great talent nationally once you get past the, the top end talent. So I think running backs just been down uh, the past two cycles, which has been a little uh, a little odd. Maybe that's kind of encouraged Michigan to, to look at a, a couple options in the portal. 
All right, well, we have one here from CFB Addict, who, shout out to you, I remember him from uh, when I was doing the video game streams on the other website. He asks, any news on where Michigan stands with Josh Connerly? Do you think Michigan leads? Um, I guess in principle, uh, Michigan may still have the advantage, but it, it hasn't been trending in a positive direction as of late. Uh, obviously, Michigan got him on campus for the game against Washington. Uh, really, really impressed him. Uh, I think Connerly, you know, loves what Michigan offers on and off the field. Uh, he has been really, really open about going further away from home. But since that visit, there hasn't been a ton of positive buzz. He's he's actually been to USC twice since then and will be back for an official visit at USC uh, once this dead period comes to an end. Uh, remember, he's already used his official visit on Michigan for that game against Washington. So if he gets back to Ann Arbor, it'll actually be an unofficial visit, meaning he'd have to pay his own way, uh, which is an expensive trip from Seattle to uh, to Detroit Wayne. Um, but I think that, you know, Michigan's still still fighting. They're still very much in it. Um, you know, there was there was a reason that Michigan was far and away the leader earlier this fall, Sharon Moore. Uh, stopped by and saw him uh, at school and made an in-home visit as well um, last week. And then Jim Harbaugh is scheduled to go in-home uh, once the dead period comes to an end. Uh, Connerly's developed a nice little friendship with Connor Jones, Michigan's uh, uh, offensive tackle signee, uh, and, and he's kind of helping out with the recruitment there. Uh, and again, Michigan's, you know, in the college football playoff, the offensive line has been phenomenal, Coach Moore has been a terrific first year offensive line coach. Um, so I think the boxes are all still there. And then in order for Michigan to win this recruitment, they have to get them back on campus one. Jim Harbaugh has to knock it out of the park on his in-home visit. Um, but USC, obviously with Lincoln Riley, they're making a, a big push. He has some uh, good relationships with some staff members that, that were kept by Riley. And then Washington uh, is another school to watch. It's obviously close to home. I mean, Connerly uh, goes to school literally right down the road from the University of Washington. Um, and then uh, Courtney Morgan is now on staff there, Michigan's former director of uh, player personnel who uh, was having a, a key role in that recruitment. I don't think losing Morgan was devastating for Michigan as much as it is, you know, it helps Washington get back in the race. All right, we'll go to – all right, well, I need to – because a lot of people have dropped this one in the chat so far. I've seen it on the four. I've seen it, and you guys, maybe there's – you might know what direction this is going. Maybe you can or can't say, but uh, people want to know what's going on with the quote-unquote secret recruit. What's – anything there that we should address while we're here? The secret recruit has, like, taken a, a life of his own. I don't even know if the secret <laughs> recruit is, is real or not. I don't know if I mistakenly, I'm, I'm just going to be completely honest here. I don't know if I mistakenly said there was a secret recruit while I was putting up some notes or something. Uh, I will tell you that I, I might have mentioned something or other. Michigan was recruiting uh, Dalen Everett, who decommitted from Clemson and, and then committed to Georgia yesterday. Uh, there was also a, a secret recru recruit at one point that Michigan visited during uh, the bye week. That was Jaheim Singletary uh, down in Jacksonville, a former Ohio State commit, but but he's definitely not coming to Michigan. Um, yesterday, one of the, uh, you know, quote unquote board insiders posted um, that there was, there could be a secret recruit. So maybe they're referring to his post. Um, you know, I, I'm not that poster, so I can't tell you who he was talking about, but I, I'm not hiding anything at one point. The, the wording of Alex Orgy visiting Michigan this past weekend could have been interpreted as a secret recruit. As I mentioned earlier, I'm really close to the Orgy family, having uh, lived in the same little uh, cul-de-sac and having covered both of his older brothers. So I was trying to keep his visit under wraps. I was trying to keep his commitment under wraps as well. I texted Tim, I guess, actually with Orgy, I texted Tim yesterday, uh, last night while all that negative news was coming in within the hour. I was like, hey, RG's picking Michigan, but I don't know uh, exactly how to approach this because I didn't want to put in a pick or whatever. So that was a little bit more of a, a sensitive uh, recruitment as well. But I don't know that there is like one particular like, <laughs> like <laughs> recruits, like been all these secret recruits that have been like morphed into one guy. 
Yeah, that's the other thing too. Is uh, if 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 it's a DB, it's it's definitely not them because Michigan is very much full at DB, and and uh, so I I I I heard rumors of Dalen Everett was a secret crew, Jaheim Singletary, Sherrod Koval. Uh, yeah, none of those guys. I mean, all of those guys are are DBs. Michigan's very much full at DB. So, uh, and also so, Cody Jones is officially in the in the boat, officially signed. So that's cool. that's a DB right there for you. There you go. Secret recruit right there. Uh, so, no, they're not going to flip Travis Hunter back from Jackson State or anything like that. So Someone tweeted at me. I wish we could just get Jack. I wish we could just get Travis Hunter from Jackson State. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what a what a timeline we live in right now. But uh, good. This is a good segue talking about um, Alex Orgy here um, from Ben Ricketts. A couple people asked this, but Ben's just the most recent one. Uh, committed as a quarterback, but what position do you think he will ultimately wind up playing at Michigan? Well, he's going to get a fair shake at quarterback, and that was one thing that the Orgy family wanted to make clear on their official visit to Michigan is they, they wanted a, a, a real opportunity to play quarterback. And actually, Matt Weiss was, was really in on him early on in the winter. His primary recruiter back in the winter when Michigan initially offered was uh, Mo Linguist, who bolted to Buffalo. Uh, but Mo, being from uh, Dallas, had known the Orgy family for a while, which is why he kind of took the lead in that recruitment. But Weiss was heavily involved then, and then became the primary recruiter as we moved here, uh, you know, deep into into the fall as we approach signing day. So Weiss really likes him. Like I said, you know, Weiss, if Michigan missed on quite a few quarterbacks this cycle. But if you remember early in the process, Weiss was really looking for a guy that could run. Their, their top, top of the board target was Nate Johnson, who, you know, progressed as a passer and, and impressed in Elite 11, but was known more for his, you know, four or five speed. I, I think he had like a 10, uh, six, 100 meter or even faster than that. Uh, so Weiss was really looking for a guy that could run first, maybe even more so uh, than, than could throw. Weiss is a smart guy. I think he trusts his ability to maybe fix some mechanical issues. Um, so when you look at Orgy, he is a guy that can run. When you look at his tape, he runs. I mean, he runs well, and he's a bigger guy than a Nate Johnson. Might not be as fast as Nate, but he can definitely, he definitely has some wheels, and he's at, you know, 6'3", 225 pounds. And all the Orgy brothers look the same. They're all, like, super cut up, like this rock-solid build. Um, so he's a, he's a guy that, that definitely could be a dual-threat quarterback if he cleans up his mechanics. He has the arm strength. Uh, but he does still have some mechanical things to work through, throwing motion to work through, accuracy issues to work through. Uh, those are all things that sound like major issues, but I think Matt Weiss feels like he can work with. Um, but to your point, yes, he does have position flexibility. When I first met Alex, he was a freshman, and he was playing some wide receiver. He was playing some defensive back. He's gotten so big now that I think he's – uh, he can be a box safety if needed, but likely, you know, if he ends up on the defensive side of the ball, maybe more of an, an edge rusher or a linebacker. Uh, both of his older brothers are, are linebackers at Vanderbilt. Uh, his oldest brother, Alston Orgy, was actually uh, a really highly touted linebacker recruit um, that, again, ended up at, at Vanderbilt. But, yeah, he, he does have a ton of position flexibility, but they are going to give him a fair shake at quarterback. All right, this one's from Charles Jones, and we got probably about six or seven minutes here. So, any other final questions you want to get in? Again, make them make sure they're recruiting. I see a lot of football questions. We'll do a football live stream probably sometime next week as we ramp up uh, you know, for the holidays and for the bowl uh, for the Orange Bowl. But um, Charles Jones asks, which players are playing in the Army All American and Under Armour All American All Star game? Um, the Army All-American game will have Tyler Morris and Zeke Berry. Connor Lee will be there as well. I know he's not a commit, but obviously he'll be a big target. The Under Armour game um, will have Will Johnson, Keon Saab, and uh, Amarion Walker as well. So um, that's kind of the list of guys that, that are playing in those games right now. I know it's a really short list, um, maybe some late additions. Um, Connor Jones just got added to the Under Armour list, didn't he? Or the Adidas? No, actually, he did not. Uh, The U.S. Army, I was informed that the U.S. Army uh, is coming back with their own bowl game, and they are now challenging the Adidas game, which was the Army game, 
So some confusion there, <laughs> but <laughs> apparently that's what's happening. I don't know. There's uh, some bowl game dramas in the uh, high school all-star sphere. And then there is the Polynesian Bowl. Uh, that will feature Zeke Berry, Kevontae Henry, who's still technically a commit, and uh, Josh Connerly will be there as well. We'll do have uh, a Also, bit. heads up, Deuce, Deuce Spurlock is officially in the class. There was, there was oh. some concern there at one point. It's, uh, it's, it's all clear now. Deuce Spurlock is in the class. Yep, Spurlock is in. Oh, good, good looking out. Tim was just about to bring that up here. Um, let's see. We got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, this one's from Kuro, and it, it goes to the um, the twenty twenty three class. But let's know about Dante Moore. Did Michigan take the lead with Dante after the Ohio State game? Well, Dante wasn't at the Ohio State game. He was playing for a state championship that day, but he, he did get to watch uh, most of the game before then. Uh, they actually watched it a little bit at the uh, at the high school, at King High School, which is right you know down the street from Ford Field. Um, but look, Michigan's in a really good spot with Dante. I, I was just at King low-key the other day um, hanging out with Dante before I went out and saw Will. Um, and, you know, he's building a really good relationship with Matt Weiss. Jim Harbaugh offered him when he was a middle schooler. Michigan's obviously doing extremely well on the field. Um, you know, he he likes everything that Michigan offers off of it. He trains with former Michigan quarterback Devin Gardner. Uh, so a lot of things playing in the right, you know, favor for Dante at the same time. Uh, Dante doesn't really love recruiting. I, I, I talked to Will about this a little bit. Uh, Will and Dante are good friends. And, and Dante has the most magnetic personality, just the most outgoing kid, super, super funny. And then when you want to talk to him about recruiting, he just shuts down. <laughs> and it's just like he doesn't like <laughs> recruiting. Um, and so I think with Dante, he's going to take his time a little bit. He did tell me he'd like to make an earlier decision, but... He's not going to rush it if he doesn't have to. He, he'd like to make a few visits in the spring before ultimately pulling the trigger. But, yes, Michigan will always be a major player in his recruitment. And I'll have a, a full update with Dante coming over at the Wolverine. I'm just saving it uh, as we get through uh, the 2022 class today. Yeah, speaking of the 23 class, we're going to have a whole lot more content kind of after the week, kind of setting the table for, for what that really looks like. Michigan's got a real opportunity there. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make sure y'all are up to date on on who the targets are, um, and and once Michigan kind of gets off the road and off, off this bowl game prep, uh, they they'll probably make some offers too because that board is is ever shifting and you know they're a little behind on some offers as well. Cool. Well, I'll ask you a question and I'll give you guys a quick uh, sh- chance to uh, push what you're doing the rest of the day here. Positions of need, pretty well, pretty well covered. Uh, it seems like in the 2022 class, but when you look at it 2023, what are some spots that you see this uh, staff recruiting pretty hard? Definitely going to go after edge rushers. I mean, you're kind of seeing how the board's shaking out here late with Ethan Burke flipping, Kevonte Henry um, likely not signing with Michigan. I mean, obviously Derek Moore would be a great land, and we talked about some of the things about him as being more of a tweener. Same thing with Michael Pollard, but I think. There are a lot of talented edge rushers that are very, very interested in Michigan that have seen what Aiden Hutchinson has done this year as a Heisman finalist. I think Michigan could take like four edge rushers. I mean, I really do. Um, They obviously need to find the uh, future at that position. So I think edge rusher uh, will definitely be a a position of need. Uh, You know, wide receiver uh, will still be a position of need. I mean, Tyler Morris and Darius Clemens, if they land them, could be the only takes obviously a Marion Walker's in the class as well, but like we mentioned earlier, it could end up at a defensive back. So I think you'll see some more, uh, you know, wide receiver, um, some wide receiver offers. And then uh, along the offensive line, for sure, Michigan only has two offensive line commits right now. Um, so they're, they're definitely going to take a bigger offensive line class and a lot of offensive line recruits interested as well because of what Michigan's offensive line has done this season. Yeah, I'd uh, I, w- I was going to mention offensive line as one. You know, Michigan's already got I think three that are that have named Michigan as their leader, or or you know, our Michigan is trending in the very very positive direction for, and none of those three are really like the big fish that they're after at the O line position, which is a testament to how big this class could be. Um, and so you've got those three guys. I think a position less of a position of need, but more of a position they're going to make a big splash in is linebacker. They already have a commit from. Uh, um, uh, Tallahassee Lincoln linebacker 
um, uh, four star. It is. It has been a day. I'm sorry. I'm blanking on his name. Um, <laughs> Raylan Wilson, correct. Yes, Raylan Wilson is already committed, and Michigan is also in a really good spot with a couple of the other top linebackers in the country. Tackett Curtis comes to mind, um, and you know they're they're really pushing at the linebacker position. They're in on three or four of the top ten linebackers in the country. Just overall, obviously, Raylan's already on board, um, so they have a chance to make a really big splash and get some impact guys at that position in 2020, 2023. All right, well. I think that's going to do it. We just took up an hour of your guys' time, and I know time is so valuable for you guys today. Hopefully you get a chance to coffee up a little bit or, or do something to replenish for the stretch run here, but you guys are Energizer bunnies, and we know it'll keep rolling along. So uh, it's been the Wolverine.com live stream here on National Signing Day. Thank you to EJ Holland. Thank you to Tim Verkees. You guys are killing it. Uh, make sure to head over to the site, and if you're not a member of the site, um, our dollar for a year subscription deal is still live and, and you are going to get the goods. You are going to get an abundance of content. And if you sign up today, you're basically getting two national signing days worth of, uh, of content, given that this deal stretches over the span of a year. So thank you to that. If you're here watching live, subscribe, uh, for podcast people or Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your shows guys. Thank you so much. Uh, do what you got to do here. Um, and we'll talk to you again soon.